It is so good to be here with you. I, uh, man, I just love being in this place uh, with you all, and what a privilege it is. My name is Will. Um, I am one of the pastors here, and uh, I have the, the privilege of my title is Soul Care Pastor, so I have the privilege of caring for souls, and uh, it's a wonderful honor that God has given. I don't know about you, but I love the parables of Jesus. I mean, when you think about the parables in in the most vivid way, Jesus communicates truth, but this amazing truth that is direct and yet at the same time really subtle. And so this morning, uh, we're going to look at a, a very famous parable of Jesus uh, that uh, Jesus uh, tells within the Gospels. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Very familiar parable but begins this way. Luke writes this in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, all drawing near to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so, so often is the case, um, Jesus is uh, in trouble with the religious authorities The religious authorities are bringing heat to Jesus. And uh, as very characteristic of Jesus, he launches into a story. Um, But this is not just any story. It's a a parable that's uh, pregnant with with meaning and significance. So in verse 11, um, we see the introduction to the players of this story. There was a man who had two sons. So as we read this, we kind of mentally settle in. We're going to hear a, a wonderful story. We're going to unpack and, and enter into the human drama. You see, parables, they give us permission to, to wonder, to ask, to imagine, and to enter in and place ourselves into the role of the players. And so this morning, as we do just that, as we enter into the story, I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to highlight four significant statements as we work through this parable. And this, these statements are worth our, our attention and our exploration. So the parable begins. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. So one of the first curiosity questions that arise as we enter into the parable is, what was going on in the heart of the younger son? I mean, can you imagine and we can use our sanctified imagination. And it, it seems that this son, he's an entitled child with no real respect, no care, no love for his father. I mean, can you imagine coming to your, your parents and saying, hey, will you go ahead and give me my inheritance now? I, I know it's coming to me, but go ahead and bring it now. It's as if the younger son is saying, I, I wish you were dead. Uh, give me what's owed to me. And so in a, in a shocking response, verse 12, the father, he divides his property between the two sons. You ask, what parent would do that? And yet, that's the father's response. And so the text continues, not many days later, the younger son, he, he gathered all he had, and he took a journey into a far-off country. Ah, the the, the far-off country. You know, mentally, maybe he had been dreaming, he had this postcard in his mind, this this, this thought that he had been um, giving his attention to, the far-off country, this postcard that that offered him excitement and luxury and, and sensuality, and he wanted to go there. So the far-off country, it looked bright. It looks shiny. So we ask, what's going on in the heart of the sun? Well, the sun is is believing that life is found outside of the father's house. You see, we we all have our far-off countries. It may not be the physical location, uh, but we we all have this far-off country that has this allure. You see, Satan, he he does his primary work by selling us this mirage of where we're going to find life. And for the son, the mirage was life is found in this far-off country. 
So when we think of the work of the enemy, when we think of the work of, of Satan within the world and, and his evil within the world, please don't fall into the trap of, of Satan being the uh, little red devil that sits on your shoulder. You see, Satan is committed to the all-out assault of selling you the postcard of the far-off country. That's his work of evil in the world of selling you the picture that life is found outside the Father's house. If only you could go there, you could find life. It's interesting, I'm reading over the last several months, my youngest daughter and I are reading at night the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, we just finished The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And within this beautiful allegory, it's really interesting, the White Witch, who's the representation of Satan and evil uh, within the land of Narnia, the white witch is beautiful. She's enticing. And if you remember the story, the white witch offers Edmund Turkish delight in their first exchange. She offers him something wonderful. And he takes it and he eats it. And it's the best candy he's ever had. And then, not only that, she offers him the alluring picture of, if you come to my house, you can have as much of this as you want. And you can rule, and you can rule over your siblings. She, she gave this picture of the far-off country. Verse 13, not many days later, <clears throat> the younger son, he gathered all he had. He took a journey, went to the far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. The son, he goes to the far-off country, and he lives it up. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, baby. I mean, he was, he was in it. Didn't deny himself anything, every pleasure. He bought property. He met beautiful women, and it was really good for a season. You see, that, that's the enticement that Satan sells. It, it's a pleasure for a season. The Bible tells us that, that sin has pleasure for a season. And the younger son, he indulged himself in all of those pleasures, and it felt good. He enjoyed it. One of my favorite uh, movies of years, years ago, I don't know if you, you saw the movie, but it was uh, Denzel Washington in the movie Flight. He was a, a flight, a flight uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the word? He flew airplanes. A fl <laughs> a pilot, yes. <laughs> he was a pilot. And he was a brilliant pilot, but not only that, he suffered with alcoholism and there's a scene in the movie that he is in this uh this group sharing time and, and the group is saying you know here's the reasons that I'm drawn to this addiction and the, the powerful scene in the movie Denzel goes I'm an alcoholic because I like it I like it you see we are thirsty people we search and we search and we search to find life and everything but God and we fall prey to the lie that life is found outside the Father's house. But this is a futile quest. It comes with a major cost. The text says, in the far-off country, he squandered his property in reckless living. This word squander is literally the image of taking all of your possessions and throwing them to the wind. He squandered everything in reckless living. It would be better translated debauchery. There was nothing that he didn't give himself it was full on embrace of, of all the things that the enemy offered all the allurement of, of the far off country but it came with a cost when he had spent everything a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need so he was industrious enough he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the field to feed pigs and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. That's the picture of the cost. That's the picture is, is, is he lost everything. He squanders all his possessions. Works a job culturally of that day would have been the lowest job that you could have imagined. This was the low of the lows. This was the original dirty jobs. And he hires himself out, and he works on a pig farm. And he's starving. And he's alone. And the text is very clear. No one helped him with anything. 
And suddenly he comes to the place of saying, this slop that I'm feeding these pigs, I'm so hungry it looks enticing to me. You see, that's where the far-off country will take you. Our sin, it will mock us. Our, our idolatry, it will destroy us. And, and there is a high, high price. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he says this, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? He makes a plan. I will arise. I'll go to my father and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned before you. Just as, a, as an aside here, no one really comes to a place of true, full repentance until they feel the weight of their consequences. You see, full, deep, biblical repentance happens when someone says, I am so tired of living this way. And the son came to that place. The far-off country had a massive price tag. And he realized, my father's slaves are better off. My father's slaves are getting three square meals a day. And here I am wanting to eat pig slop. I'm going to go to my father and I'm just going to beg to be a servant. I'm just going to beg to be a servant. You see, I love the phrase, he came to himself. He came to his senses. There was a sense of repentance. He said, I, not only have I sinned against my father, but I've sinned against God. You see, he felt the full weight of his consequences. I don't know about you, but, but I've, I've known and, and worked with people who've struggled with addiction over the years. And I'm really convinced that someone will not change until they come to the point of saying, I am so tired of this. I had a friend years ago who, who struggled with deep addiction. Kept going back and back to the, to the old way. Kept going back to the far off country. Over and over, years, decades. Finally, he called me one day and he goes, I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of where it's brought me. I'm so tired of, of the cost that it's been in my life. And there was change and there was repentance. The father, the, 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 the son has a plan. He's going to go to his dad and he's going to say, Dad, I've sinned. I've sinned, Dad. I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. Would you just bring me back as one of your hired servants? And he makes the long journey home. But then we read this, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Oh, I love this scene. I love this scene. Don't, don't let yourself not feel the drama to feel the emotion of this scene. It doesn't say it in the text, but I like to think that maybe the father had his specific place that he went every day. And he would look. And he would look to the horizon and he would see is this the day that my son's coming home? In this particular day, the Bible says, while his son was a long way off, he saw him. And he knew it was his son. How, we don't know. I tend to think, you know, years ago, 15 years ago, I graduated from Dallas Seminary. And at that time, when we graduated, we, uh, we had this large church that we graduated and probably set 10,000 people. My parents were kind of up in the nosebleed section, and we all came escorting in as graduates, you know, wearing our goofy caps and gowns, and we all kind of looked alike, you know. They were seeing us, our backs, as we walked in. And my mother turns to my wife, and she goes, There's Will. There's Will. I can see him. I, I can see him because I can tell the way he walks. She knew. This father knew. He sees his son. He's a long way off. My son, he's coming home. And I love the scene, but while he was still a long way off, his father felt compassion, and the father runs. The father runs. I don't know about you, but my dad was a, he was a very dignified man. If I would have seen my dad running, it would have done something to me. My dad didn't run. And this dignified father, he runs to his son embraces him he he kisses him the literal meaning is the the father fell upon the neck of his son he abandons all appearance of dignity so the second question what what happens in the heart of the father what's happening in the heart of the father in this moment you see the father he's overflowing with with lavish joy that his son has come home 
Remember the, the plan of the son. The, the, the son is just saying, Dad, I'm just going to come back. I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he begins to rehearse the speech. And, and, and the, the father doesn't even listen to him. The father says this, Quickly bring the best robe and put it on him. Put on the ring and put on his shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is, is found and they began to celebrate. What's going on in the heart of the father? There's, there's overwhelming, unrestrained celebration that his lost son, the son that he thought was dead, is now alive. He's home. Do you catch the extravagance? Put on the best robe. Put on a new ring. Kill the fatted calf. It would have been very rare within Jewish culture to have meat. But not only that, to kill the most prized possession, to kill the fatted calf. There's banquet, there's celebration, there's, there's, there's music, there's dancing, there's, there's drink, there's a party. There's a party. And, and, and can, you, can you picture the father, I can, going around, my son's home. My son's home. Can you believe it? He's home. I thought he was dead. I thought he was gone. But he's home. What a beautiful picture of celebration, of joy. But then we go to Act, act 3. It would have been great if it just ended there. Had someone tell me between the service, I love hearing the story of, of the prodigal son. That's, that's, that's awesome. I'm not sure I like the third act. The third act comes, verse 25. Now the older son was in the field. And he came and he drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. Don't let yourself skip over the drama of, of the vivid picture that Jesus is creating. The older son, he's walking up the hill. He sees in the distance. He hears music. He hears dancing. And he leans over to his servant and he says, what's going on? He called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And his servant said, your brother, your brother's come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But then the text reads, but the older brother, he was angry and he refused to go in. Our third question, what's going on in the heart of the older brother? There's a deep anger so much so that he's unwilling to enter the party. What's going on in his heart? Well, we don't, have to, we don't have to make a guess. Verse 29, he answers his father. Father comes out. Brother refuses to come in. The father comes out. He's in the middle of the dancing. He's in the middle of the party. He realizes, my older son's not here. And he goes out. He says, older brother, to the father look father these these many years i have served you and i've never disobeyed your command and yet you never gave me a young goat that i might celebrate with my friends but but when this son of yours you catch he doesn't even say my brother he says when this son of yours who who came home who has devoured your property with prostitutes you killed the fatted calf for him What's in the heart of the older brother? He's saying, I, I've served you. I've done everything right. I've been faithful to you. I've never disobeyed you. And you've done nothing for me. You've never even so much as killed a young goat for me. And when this screw-up son of yours comes home, you're going to kill the fatted calf? Can you picture, use your imagination, can you picture the father saying, Son, why are you talking to me this way? Son, what this language that you've, you've served me, you've never disobeyed me. Son, are you, a, are you my son or are you a slave? The father responds, verse 31, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. Son, all of this is yours. Son, you've always had this. Son, it was fitting to celebrate and to be glad for your brother. He was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And Jesus ends the parable at that point. 
And we go, oh, man. Cliffhanger. We don't know how it ends. We don't know if the son said, oh, you're right, Dad, and he enters the party and he celebrates. We're left hanging. So we've seen what's in the heart of the younger son, what's in the heart of the father, what's in the heart of the older brother. The final statement is this. What's the point of the parable? What's the point of the parable? Well, we've got to go back to the original context. Remember, in Luke chapter 15, the whole point of Jesus telling his parable was because the tax collectors and the sinners were were drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, and they were saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus is receiving sinners. Jesus is eating uh, with those who are unrighteous. Jesus is hanging out with people of ill repute. And Jesus tells this story. And you see, the original audience, having heard this, we would think that they would maybe be wiping away their tears at this you know, beautiful story, at this, this uh, touching story of a father embracing the prodigal son and coming home. But the point of the story was this. Jesus is telling the parable not to create a picturesque scene, but to disrupt the religious leaders. This was not a warm fuzzy. This was a slap in the face. Jesus is saying to the religious leaders who were grumbling that he accepts sinners and tax collectors, he is saying, my father throws elaborate parties when prodigals come home and you are unwilling to come to the party and celebrate. He's saying, you don't understand my grace. You don't understand my love. And it would have been a dagger in the heart of the religious leaders. You see, grace is so attractive to people who are broken. Grace is so attractive to people who are in desperate need. Jesus constantly got in trouble in the Gospels because he hung around the tax collectors and the sinners. They, they, they wanted to be in his presence. They couldn't wait to be with him. They loved being with Jesus. Can you imagine that? Perfectly holy. Jesus never compromised. He never went the way of their sin. And yet there was something so attractive about the life of Jesus that they couldn't wait to be with him. And boy, the religious leaders, the older brothers, they were unwilling to enter the party. C.S. Lewis says this, Prostitutes are in no danger of finding their present life so satisfactory that they cannot turn to God. It's not hard for them to turn to God. It's the proud, it's the avarice, it's the self-righteous who are in danger of that. You see, those who know they are broken, um, there's, there's no danger of them turning to God. It's water to a thirsty soul. But to those who are proud, to those who are self-righteous, it's very hard. And so Jesus is telling this parable to confront the religious authorities. He was confronting the older brother's spirit within the religious leaders. So as we end our time today, let's ask ourselves this question. What is the older brother's spirit, and how do I make sure I'm not possessing that? How do I I ensure I'm not living as the older brother? So we know this, that, that the older brother was unwilling to celebrate when the lost were found. The older brother's spirit, it it really boils down to this. God didn't have to do too much to save me. I'm pretty good. Hadn't done bad stuff. I I surely haven't gone out to the far country like the prodigal. You know, I've, I've lived a pretty moral life. And Jesus is saying, you're still lost. You see, the older brother says, the older brother's spirit says, I've done everything right. And so when things come that we don't quite understand that God brings in our life, the older brother's spirit says, God, you owe me. You owe me because I've worked so hard for you. I've done everything for you. Really, the older brother's spirit, if we could just boil it down to its very essence, the, the spirit is this, it's, A righteousness that's based on performance. I'm right because of what I do. You see, I've never disobeyed. I've served you. 
in, in the gospel, the gospel comes and dismantles the older brother spirit. I love the way Tim Keller puts this, that the, the, the beauty of the gospel is there are two sides of the gospel. On the one side is this, you are more loved than you can ever imagine. That's, a, that's what we live in with the good news of the gospel. You are more loved than you can ever imagine. That's the message to the prodigal. Come home. Come home. God's, God's entreating you. Come home. Come home to where life is found. Come to the Father's house. You're more loved than you can imagine. And the second half of that flip over the coin, second half of the, the, the gospel is this, that you are worse than you think you are. You're more loved than you can imagine, and you're worse than you think you are. That's the message to the older brother. You have a need. You have a need. You need grace. The older brother, spirit is, God is saying, you, you possess my morals, but you lack my compassion. You see, the religious leaders, they, they, were, they made the assumption that they were on the inside that they were a part of the club. Why? Because of what they did. Because, because of their adherence to the law. Um, because of their act, religious activity. Because of their scrutiny and their tithing. So outwardly, we would look at the religious leaders, we would look at the scribes and Pharisees, and we would say, wow, they're model Christians. And Jesus would say, no, you're lost. You're lost. Why? Because your hearts are far from me. He said this statement over and over to the, to the religious authority. He says, on the outside, you're like a clean cup. Looks great. But on the inside, no, the inside is filthy. He said, you're like a whitewashed tomb. You know, outside it's pristine, but inside it's rotting bones. Jesus always went to the inside of who we are. And so for the older brother, what does repentance look like for the older brother's spirit? It's this. I live in repentance when I realize that my relational sin is just as ugly as my behavioral sin. Catch that. My relational sin is just as ugly as my behavioral sin. So I may not be living the life of the prodigal. I may not be going off in the far off country. I may not be living a life of debauchery. And yet, inwardly, my relational sin of pride, of self-righteousness, of placing myself above others is just as grievous in the heart of God as my behavioral sin. So repentance for the older brother means saying, God, I am in need of grace. I'm in need of grace. Whether I'm the prodigal or the older brother, I'm in need of grace. And so when we really reflect on that reality that you know, outwardly, I may not be in behavioral sin. Everything may look well, but if you give an inside look into my life, I'm judgmental. I think I'm better than you. I'm prideful. I, I live as if my righteousness is based on my performance. Listen, the good news for the older brother, the good news for the older brother's spirit is this. Your righteousness is foreign. It's given apart from you. It's the righteousness of Christ given to you and your response is to, to freely accept his righteousness. And that's the good news of the gospel. We think of Romans 7 where, where Paul is, is seeing the internal battle of his life and he makes this statement, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He feels the weight of his sin. You see, outwardly, Paul was a righteous man. Paul says that, Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had the pedigree, but inwardly he would say, I have relational sin that keeps me from God. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, we have access to the Father because of his, the righteousness of the Son given to us. So where does this leave us today? For those of us who hang around the church, I think we hang around long enough, it's, harder, it, it, it's easy to slip into the mode of the older brother. It's real easy to do that. And so where we are left today is saying this, God, I'm in need of grace. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're the prodigal. You said, my life, my life is so messed up. The good news for you is to come home. 
Come home. God wants to clean you up. He wants to give you his royal robes. He wants to put on the, the, the ring of his righteousness. Come home. And maybe you're here and you're an older brother and you say, I've lived that for so long. And God is saying, come home. Come home. Both are in need of grace. We never outgrow our need for grace. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your word that uh, pierces our hearts. Lord, thank you that um, there's such good news. There's good news for the prodigal and there's good news for the older brother. You love them both. And so, Lord, um, would you help us? Would you help us to live a life of um, continual repentance, of continual dependency? And, Lord, to know that um, we, we, may, we may be outwardly living a righteous life and yet inwardly Lord there's things that need to be transformed and there's things that need to be changed and so we look to you as our hope oh Lord living life on the treadmill of self performance leads to death and so Lord this day with open hands and with open hearts we come before you and we say that you are good and, and, and our filthy rags Lord, nothing. Um, Lord, and you're, you're committed. You're committed to clean us up. You're committed to give us the royal robes. You're committed to throw the lavish party for us. So, Lord, I, I, I thank you. I thank you for how your word um, will have its effect. I pray that you will use this message in my life in the lives of my brothers and sisters here this morning that it would be a ripple effect through our congregation, through this place. Lord, may we be known as people who deeply, deeply, deeply depend on your grace and your mercy and your cross and continually proclaim the good news. Thank you, Lord. And we ask all this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior.